Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. The city of New York is endlessly fascinating, and much of its history is hiding in plain sight all around us. My guest, an old friend and longtime colleague, has written a wonderful new book that takes us on a surprise-filled tour of the city that reveals some of that extraordinary history. He's Sam Roberts, the urban affairs correspondent of the New York Times, and his book is titled A History of New York in 27 Buildings, the 400-year untold story of an American metropolis. Sam, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming in. Bob, thanks for having me, and great to see you again. Uh, I should also add that Sam is the host of uh, the New York Times Close Up right here on CUNY TV. So, Sam, it's a terrific... It's good to be answering questions for a change. <laughs> I'll bet you're on the other side. Right. Um, so, explain what you uh, set out to do uh, with this book, because it's an unusual book. Well, it's interesting. I did a book uh, called Only in New York, which was about uh, things that happen here, people in the city. I did a book on Grand Central Terminal, which right. was one building. I did a book, A History of New York and 101 Objects. <laughs> and then I wondered whether I could do a history of New York in a collection of buildings. Uh, and, you know, can you tell the story of the city, the city's history, through brick and mortar? And then I realized buildings are built by people. So what I tried to do is look at the city in terms of a biography, if you will, of these buildings. Not the buildings you see for the most part on postcards or in tourist guides, right. but the kind of quirky buildings, as you say, that we take for granted, that we just walk by and never notice, but tell the rich history of this city in ways that we would never expect. And those are the things I wanted to find out. Not the history, my history. It's a very subjective one. I want people to be provoked into saying, you know, why'd you put that in? Why'd you leave that one out? And come up with their own suggestions. One of the things we learn as journalists is that there are stories everywhere. And so you have found the stories behind these buildings. And it's really fascinating. The book opens with the photo of a house in Flushing, Queens. Now, people would walk past that and, and never imagine that there's anything extraordinary going on. But there was at one time. Talk about that. Well, it's the Bown House uh, in Flushing, Queens. And it's a house that, you know, is very old. It's a 17th century house. It belonged to John Bown, who changed uh, uh, the, the notion of freedom of religion in this city long before, you know, the Bill of Rights, before uh, the Constitution, and people just have no sense of, of the role that New York played in American history. This was a century before uh, the Bill of Rights. And what happened was uh, the Quakers were discriminated against by Peter Stuyvesant. What distinguished New York from, I think, every other colony, every other settlement in what became the United States was that the Dutch did not come here to proselytize. They didn't come here to escape religious persecution. They came here to make money. And if you didn't get in their way, you were, if you want to be a cynic, you can say you were, you know, treated indifferently. Right. If you want to be an idealist, you could say you were tolerated. Uh, but Peter Stuyvesant was not one of the good guys. He was the director general, and he didn't like, among other people, Quakers. Uh, he did not tolerate them. Uh, and John Bone was an Englishman, and he said, uh, you can't do this to the Quakers. And he uh, came up, and some other people before him came up with something called the Flushing Remonstrance, a remonstrance, an appeal saying you can't discriminate against the Quakers. Which is an odd thing to be occurring at that time. It, it, this was an era when it was perfectly fine and even expected to discriminate. And certainly in the rest of what became the country uh, was going on against Catholics, against Quakers, against Jews, to some extent against blacks, of course. Uh, and 
uh, they petitioned the Dutch West India Company, uh, and they made a fascinating argument. They made an argument that God would be angry about religious persecution. I mean, this was an unheard of argument because the whole notion of you know religion was you have to stick with your own exactly. and you have to make sure that you uphold your own religion to the exclusion of everyone else. And they said, no, you know, we're all brothers under a God, whichever God you choose to worship. And they went to the Dutch West India Company and the India Company said, hey, remember, we're here to make money. We want everybody. And they reprimanded Stuyvesant, uh, and which is why later that year, 1664, when the British sailed into New York Harbor, they took over New Amsterdam without firing a shot because <laughs> the Dutch settlers there were so happy to get rid of Peter they hated Stuyvesant. Peter Stuyvesant. Exactly, that right. they were happy to be taken over by the British. But the thing is that there, there is this pretty nondescript building in Flushing, Queens, still exists today when this whole concept of freedom of religion in the United States of America uh, really got an early start, really kick-started that idea of freedom it, of religion. It sure did. And again, this is a century before the Constitution. And the same thing again with the Peter Zenger trial, which occurred at right. the site of Federal Hall. This was decades before the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, uh, all of which happened in New York. And we just have no sense of our own history. Right. Now, there's an even... Um, more nondescript uh, building at 123 Lexington Avenue, I, I believe yep. it is. Um, there's a deli there now on the, on the ground floor. What's that about? Well, it, it, there's a deli and a, and a great spice market <laughs> uh, that has great Asian and Indian spices. What it doesn't have uh, basically is any indication of the historical role that building played in New York and American history. Uh, that is the only existing building in New York City where a president of the United States was sworn in as president. Uh, it now looks like an ordinary brownstone, a retail store on the bottom. But when uh, James Garfield died, he died uh, of uh, an assassination right. attempt in New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore. That's where Chester Arthur lived. And he was sworn in there as president of the United States. He lived on Lexington they, Avenue. Well, that's right. He, they had to summon a, a judge uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, and the Times reported the next day, well, you know, there doesn't seem to be much going on here. There's a small crowd outside. They summoned a judge. He left and got on a train to Washington. And in the vestibule of that building, which is locked, there's a little plaque that occasionally gets stolen uh, that says this is the site of where the president was sworn in. And people walk by it. They go in and buy spices, which, as I say, are terrific. And no one knows this is the site where a president was sworn in. Well, you talk about not knowing the history of your uh, city, and, and a lot of us don't know a lot of that um, history. One of the things a lot of New Yorkers don't realize is that we were once, albeit briefly, the capital of the United States. We were once the capital and we were the first capital. Uh, that's absolutely true, Bob. As I say in the book, in 1789 and 1790, New York City was the first capital of the United States. It's where the first Congress met. It was where the first uh, president uh, was inaugurated, George Washington, on April 30th, 1789. Uh, it's where the Bill of Rights, what became the Bill of Rights, was passed by the first Congress. Uh, and that building, which was originally a city hall of New York, was torn down, but Federal Hall was built on the site of that, downtown on Wall Street. Uh, and Federal Hall not only is the site of what became a celebration of democracy, but that became a symbol of maritime commerce as the Custom House, which is really what made New York the capital of commerce it became. And then that building became the sub-treasury, the largest repository of gold in the United States, way more than Fort Knox. Uh, and that became the symbol of American capitalism. And again, people walk by that building, <laughs> they see the steps, they see George yep. Washington's statue on there, they usually see his behind on the business <laughs> news as they look at the stock exchange, and no one has a sense, almost no one, 
that this was the capital of the United States. It's so weird because so many people hang out there. I mean, yeah. when the weather well, it's is the only nice place to sit right? down. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, so you um, tell a story of, uh, or a part of the story of a hotel in Brooklyn. And um, one, the hotel, um, it has quite a history, but you know, its glory days were uh, decades ago. But you tell an offbeat aspect of the history of this hotel. Well, tell Bob, us about again, that. this is my history, so I felt I had <laughs> author's prerogative to include a couple of things. So how could I leave out the Brooklyn Dodgers? The Brooklyn Dodgers. But there isn't much left physically of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Ebbets Field is gone. Ebbets Field is gone. The Dodger headquarters building is gone. But the Bossert Hotel is still there. And the Bossert Hotel... Where is it? In, it's in it's uh, just down the block from the St. George and down the block from where Dodgers headquarters were, was in downtown Brooklyn. And that's where they celebrated the World Series win in 1955. Uh, and Where the Daily News had that famous headline. Who's a bum? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, and that's where uh, the, as you pointed out the other day when we discussed this, that's where um, Walter O'Malley had his rigged vote when he decided to move the team to California. And took my beloved Giants with him. That's exactly right. Uh, and... You know, I had to find some place that was connected to the Dodgers, some of whom lived in the hotel as well. Which it, I found really interesting uh, b because the players in those days did not make the astronomical salaries that, that sports figures make now. So they, they just sort of lived in this hotel, which was not a super luxury place by any, by any means. No, but, but it was, in a sense, in Brooklyn at the time. The St. George was called the biggest hotel. Right. The Bossert was called the Waldorf Astoria of Brooklyn, <laughs> uh, believe it or not. And it had this great restaurant on the roof overlooking Lower Manhattan. Uh, and, you know, Brooklyn, as we think of it now, coming back and being almost chic, uh, it really was then, too, right. uh, back in the 20s and 30s uh, uh, when uh, you know, Brooklyn was the world, as uh, Elliot Walensky said once. Now, one of the most poignant and heartbreaking stories in the book has to do with a building. Again, all of these uh, uh, buildings and, and structures in your book still exist. Has to do with a building that's on the east side of Washington Square, and you can, you can walk back and forth past it, and again, not have any real idea or even any idea of the history of it. Tell us about that building. Uh, that's a building that is now uh, used by NYU. It was the old Ash Building. And when people think of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire that killed over 100 people, most of them Italian, Jewish, uh, young women uh, who spoke Yiddish and spoke Italian, mostly immigrants, uh, working in what was basically a sweatshop, they think that building must have burned to the ground, right. but it didn't. The fire was limited to three floors. Uh, some people jumped, some people were trapped, some people couldn't escape because the fire escape was this locked. This like around the eighth or ninth floor, right? Right. Uh, it's up, up on the upper floors of the building. And the building is still there. Uh, it's still in use. Uh, and the fascinating thing about that building is that as a result of what happened there, the labor union movement, the progressive movement uh, with Al Smith, with Bob Wagner, uh, with Jimmy Walker and others, Francis Perkins, who was across Washington Square having tea, who eventually became the Secretary of Labor under uh, Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, said that's the day the New Deal began because the legislation, the progressive labor legislation, factory safety, safety legislation that came out as a result of that fire, and particularly the women in labor who led the movement, Rose Schneiderman, uh, uh, Clara Lemlich, other people like that, who led the labor, labor movement to fight for progressive legislation. That legislation passed in New York State and was carried over to the New Deal and had a profound effect 
on America. And there that building sits, there is a plaque on it, but people walk by again and, as you say, have no idea of what a profound effect it had on American history. When you say uh, Francis Perkins w was across Washington Square having tea, do you mean at the time of the fire? Yes, she oh, was indeed. Goodness. And she ran across the square and, and saw the smoke, had, had no idea of the magnitude of what was going on, but uh, obviously found out when she got there. The first woman cabinet um, yes, secretary indeed. In, uh, in America. Under history. FDR. Uh, a happier story is the story about the Coney Island boardwalk. And one of the things I found, fa there's so much that's fascinating about Coney Island, but one of the things I found fascinating was that uh, in the beginning, Coney Island, um, the, the, the beach, uh, was off limits to most New Yorkers. Uh, yeah, it was we a great could, resort area, but why was it off limits? You and, and I couldn't go there. Right, how uh, did that change? It was a private um, sanctuary, uh, in effect. Uh, the hotels in Brighton Beach, or Manhattan Beach, Coney Island were playgrounds of the rich. And the two things that changed that, in addition to some legislation, which was the result of these things, was one, the subway, and to the boardwalk. Right. Uh, and they democratized the beaches of New York. They allowed people who were trapped in tenements, trapped in ghettos, trapped in slums to get to the beach. And once they had the opportunity to get there uh, and could get there and had the potential to get there, the legislation was changed to say, you can't put barriers up, you can't block the beach. This is something that has to be accessible to the public. But before then, in the late 19th century, that was mostly a private preserve. One of the things I remember about, a um, couple so much I remember, I remember going there with cousins and aunts and uncles who lived in Bed-Stuy when I was in Jersey. I'd visit them and we'd all traipse out to uh, Coney Island. But one of the things I remember is the Daily News used to have those amazing aerial photographs mm. on the hottest days yep. of the summer of the, the, the people just packed on that beach. I can't imagine how many, um, how many hundreds of thousands. And they still are, and they still come, and they still come from all over the city there, and Reese Beach, and, right. and you know, there's a mix of people too. And Central Park, uh, and that's one of the great things about this city. And you know, there are no fights for the most part. It, 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 People, exactly. You know, I mean, it's, well, a, it's the, everybody's beach. One of the things I think about in, in New York, uh, be, because we hear about all these problems, you know, everywhere in the world, sometimes in New York, of course, but much less in New York. If you just get on the subway every morning at rush hour, you will see every kind of person imaginable, and everybody is fine. They're going to work or doing whatever it is they have to well, do. One of it's my a wonderful city. And one of my favorite things in the book, one of my favorite buildings is uh, what was the Hunter College gym in the oh, Bronx, yeah. now part of Lehman College, right. uh, where the United Nations Security Council first met uh, in 1946. We were the first on so many things. Well, that's right. Uh, <laughs> were and still are, and we forget again that part of our history. And to me, one of the great things, because this is a book, in effect, about people. Uh, again, b buildings are built by people. Uh, and as Winston Churchill said, uh, you know, we build buildings, but thereafter they shape us. And one of the things uh, that they found when the Security Council was about to vote, to take its first vote, they inspected the ballot box, and there in the ballot box was a note signed by Paul Antonio, who was an immigrant Greek carpenter who built the ballot box. And it was a note of prayer, wishing the Security Council well and hoping for world peace. And this was an ordinary carpenter from Manhattan who had right. built the box. Which tell, which is just emblematic of so much of New York City's history. Just ordinary people, um, millions and millions of immigrants, uh, people who just came here trying to get a head start in life, working hard, and, and, and that immigrant story is like really what New York has been about for That's so right. long. And you look at what goes on today and it's exactly the same thing. Maybe they're coming from somewhere else, but they're coming for all the same reasons. Now, you tell the story of something called Bank of United States, not Bank, 
Not the Bank of the United States. Bank of United States. Well, because Bank of the United States <laughs> might have sounded too official. Might so, have sounded like it had something to do with the United States. Correct. So the What's banking official story? said, you got to get rid of that V, because uh, it might have been too much of an article of faith. Uh, so this was a bank created uh, that, that catered to the immigrant, primarily Jewish community. And just as the Ash Building on Washington Square sort of led to the New Deal, arguably the, this branch, which is in the book, the Bank of United States on uh, Southern Boulevard and Freeman Street in the South Bronx, in December of 1930, the run on this bank, because it just ran out of money, right. uh, the bank went bust. Uh, this bank run, in effect, triggered the Depression, arguably. Uh, and I just find that fascinating because now it's a laundromat <laughs> and people will just walk by, have no sense at all. And what's so amazing is there's an ATM There's there. an ATM in this laundromat you in the could South take, Bronx. You could take cash out of it now, but you couldn't get cash out of it in December 1930. But even when you um, read all the histories of the, dep of the Depression and uh, the documentaries and that sort of thing, you don't hear a great deal about about this bank, and and uh, can you talk a little bit about why it failed? Well, it it failed because it was mismanaged, it was overextended. Right. But what's interesting, and and you know, there's questions about this in terms of documentary proof. But there was a lot of uh, criticism and a lot of claim that one of the reasons the bank went bust is that the big bankers, the big Wall Street bankers did not bail it out because it was a Jewish immigrant bank. And there are a lot of people in a position to know and a position of power who agreed with that premise. Right. And reading uh, your chapter on, on the bank, um, I mean, it seems like there's credence to that, to that argument. Yeah. Not, the, the book is not about, uh, you know, all of the ins and outs of that. But, um, you, you know, it's not that difficult to believe. Yeah, would that have staved means. off the Depression? No. But would it have saved this bank and hundreds of thousands of depositors in New York? Yes. We've got about a minute left. Um, uh, you were obviously, the, there's a certain arbitrariness, as you pointed out, you wanted it to be quirky. These are uh, some of the things that you found interesting about the history of New York. But what about, there were so many buildings to choose from. There must have been some buildings that you were considering that didn't quite make the cut. Uh, give us an, a couple of examples. Oh, there there were can. dozens, Bob, <laughs> and I appeal to readers to, you know, send in their own suggestions. But the Woolworth Building, uh, what you and I would call the RCA Building, right. uh, the Chrysler Building, uh, the Hamilton Grange, uh, I mean, buildings in all five boroughs that uh, I invite readers to please suggest because maybe there'll be a sequel. Right, I hope so. Uh, the book is called A History of New York in 27 Buildings. The author is Sam Roberts. Sam, thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. I have to shake my head at the idea that we live in some kind of advanced, civilized society. Many terms come to mind when I think of today's America, but advanced and civilized are not among them. Suicidal, perhaps. There are myriad examples of our commitment to literal self-destruction, our lack of any serious response to climate change, for example. Despite the unmistakable evidence all around us, wildfires, incredibly destructive hurricanes, murderous flooding, and some of the hottest temperatures we've ever seen, we refuse to take the steps needed to save ourselves from global warming. And then there's the matter of guns. Despite the hideous toll from mass shootings, one after another after another, including the slaughter of children, we refuse to do anything about gun violence. Since the tumultuous year 1968, Nearly 1.2 million people have been killed in America by guns, in homicides, suicides, and accidents. That's nearly three times the total number of Americans killed in all of World War II. Our so-called civilized society just shrugs its shoulders at this monumental bloodshed and moves on. 
Now comes a study filled with grim news about the decline in life expectancy in the United States. The study, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, found that despite leading the world in healthcare spending, the U.S. has the worst midlife mortality rate among the 17 highest income countries in the world. Life expectancy in the United States has declined for three straight years, a drop driven, as the New York Times put it, by higher death rates among people in the prime of life. The main causes were drug overdoses, alcoholism, and suicides, self-destruction. Interestingly, life expectancy in metropolitan areas along the east and west coast has improved, but in places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and Indiana, the toll has been devastating. Will we do anything about this? Some individuals may, but as a society, no. We're not doing anything about global warming. We're not doing anything about guns. Sadly, pathetically, we aren't likely to do anything about this decline in life expectancy either. That's all for now. See you next time.